welcome. Our first guest this morning spent years researching her new book, a definitive examination of the life of Elvis Presley. Elvis would have turned 87 January 8th, and the king of rock and roll's music and legacy continues more than 45 years after his death. This is uh, really hard to believe that yeah. much time has passed. I know, especially just because you think of him in a certain way mm -hmm. when you last saw him. Well, we welcome Arthur, author Sally o Hodel to Virginia this morning. Congratulations on the book. We're excited to chat with you this morning. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sally, Sally, the, Elvis's life is just, life and, and after, after his death, is just enshrouded in myth and legend. It, it is. And as you said, he's been, you know, he would have been 87 this year. He's been gone for almost 45 years now. And he's still recognizable the world over by his image and his first name alone. You know, and that's, that's incredible. And that's powerful. But you do reach that iconic status. And unfortunately, he's probably one of the biggest victims of sensationalism and romanticism. And a lot of our, especially pop culture ideas of him, you know, are flawed at this point. Sally, a lot of folks watching right now are in disbelief that it's been that amount of time and of course that he would have, uh, it would have been an 87th birthday. First, as the author, what drew you to this subject? Well, I'm a lifelong fan of Elvis. You know, I discovered him as a little kid when my dad would play records. I always say I'm lucky that my childhood had a soundtrack because there was always great music playing in the house um, when he would play albums on the weekends and whatnot. And I always left, you know, the books that I would read as a lifelong enthusiast with more questions than answers. And as a journalist, this was just kind of a coming together of personal and professional endeavor, real labor of love. And I had an idea and it was just amazing how much evidence there was to support it. So out of that grew a book. Well, and there's some some interesting misconceptions that I'm sure, you know, you've spent so much time researching, especially related to the way that he lived his life and that aspect of perceived self-destruction. But you have other facts to present. What would you say? Absolutely. You know, Elvis's story is long told as one of self-destruction. And through my research and, you know, speaking to people who knew Elvis and four years of work on this book, I see Elvis's story as a futile struggle to survive. And first he struggles through extreme poverty and then through extreme fame that no one had really experienced at the level that he did before him. And, and then through a series of health ailments, you know, when Elvis passes in 1977, he has disease or disorder in nine of the 11 systems of the body, often, you know, long kind of written off as the end result of the prescription medication problem. And it was a problem. The book doesn't sugarcoat that. Uh, but it does look at where some of these ailments came from. And most of them were genetic in nature. His maternal grandparents were first cousins. So he really is struggling to find a way to continue being Elvis Presley through a lot of disease and disorder within his body. And we see it throughout his family. So this book examines all of that. And it helps you know, to explain some of the lifestyle choices that he made. Sally, you touched on the fact that it was unprecedented, the type of fame that he was experiencing. He almost defined the genre of being a superstar. When we had you on before, and I talked with you about this before we got started this morning, um, a viewer reached out to me and said, he, he really profited and was successful because of other, taking advantage of other people's successes. We talked a little bit about that. You've, you've probably encountered that in some of your research. Yeah, the thing about Elvis, you know, he wasn't the only one making that kind of music. He wasn't the only one doing rock and roll. Uh, he was always very clear about that. And the thing about Elvis is that he looked different, he sounded different, and he moved different. And then, of course, he has the television and the Ed Sullivan show. So he's able to go into every home. And then people can really experience just how different he was. Uh, but in terms of, like, cultural appropriation and whatnot, you know, Elvis was great friends with B.B. King and Chuck Berry and Jackie Wilson and Sammy Davis Jr. And all of them can attest. They're all over YouTube and in interviews talking about how, you know, Elvis opened doors for them as well. So Elvis was always very clear that his influences came from a multitude of places and every genre. You know, he listened to just a ton of different types of music and different sounds, especially growing up in Tupelo and then living in Memphis. Uh, he was just exposed to so many different sounds. And he was always very clear about that, that the influences came from a variety of places. Mm. And there may be some misconception as well about his personality and who he truly was, understanding the level of fame that he had reached. You know, you might assume or you might have heard that he was um, quite gluttonous, but you have found that he's a giver. He was a giver and that he did so much for his community and for his family. Tell us a little bit about what you found in that research. 
Absolutely. Without question. I think the king of rock and roll, just that title alone probably leads to those ideas of gluttony over the years. Um, and there are some incredible stories, you know, of Elvis um, giving, giving, giving for every decade of his career. You know, there's stories of how he gave away over 200 cars, uh, jewelry. You know, if he read about someone who needed a wheelchair. He would literally go to their house with the latest, best wheelchair he could buy and deliver it himself within Memphis. You know, I mean, there are so many stories like that. And what we really need to remember about Elvis is that he didn't, you know, set out to become the most famous man on the planet. He didn't set out to change music as they knew it. Uh, he set out to provide for his family because he knew he was the only one who could pull them out of poverty. He had hoped that music would be the way he could do that. And, and it was, he was very successful. He pulls his parents out of poverty. That was his main agenda. But then he has aunts and uncles and cousins working working and living at Graceland. His grandmother lives at Graceland. And again, this, this, you know, level of providing that he feels so committed to, it really does impact his whole story because when he is sick in the seventies and he needs to stop, he's touring more and more and more. And he says, I can't stop. So many people rely on me. So not only did he pull them out of poverty, but he felt like it was his job to keep them there as well. And that's a lot of people. It ends up being over a hundred people between his staff and crew and the touring and then all of his family. And Sally, as you mentioned, he he probably was outperforming much later than he needed to be health-wise. There's this perception, certainly he was propped up by quite a few uh, drugs, prescription drugs, to help him keep going or, you know, in that perception. A lot of folks believe that he died of an overdose or that he's not gone at all. So, <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, and it does get to the point where he needs the medication to be Elvis Presley. It does become a double edged sword because he is dealing with a heart issue, with a liver issue, with a immune system disorder, with insomnia, you know, some things that just really weren't, uh, they didn't know how to treat them in the 70s. So they kind of throw a lot of different medication at him. They do have tolerance and addiction levels. All of that becomes an issue. But now we can understand why Elvis turned to the prescription medication in the first place. And that's a huge, huge you know, question to answer. Um, so, yeah, and there are people out there who think he's still alive. We all wish it was true. But, you know, Elvis died on August 16th, 1977. Wow. Fascinating book. And I, did this bring you, uh, it's just, I find it really interesting that this was a tether for you and for your father, Sally, and that you, you know, were able to share this and, and doing this research, did this bring many new things to light for you? Absolutely. You know, it, it, this book restores Elvis's humanity. That was my goal. Uh, but it was really amazing to learn to learn as much as I did. And of course, now I'm friends with, you know, 10, 15 people who knew Elvis and to have those relationships, like that's just an extra gift of all of this. As a, as a kid listening to Elvis and reading about Elvis, I, I had no idea I would not only meet these people, but, you know, call them my friends as well. And that's just an incredible bonus of the whole thing. Absolutely. Well, Sally, thank you so mm -hmm. much. It was nice talking with you and interesting hearing this background on the research. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. And before we head to break, it's time to make you a winner. Caller 6 right now to 3425745. Wins a copy of Elvis Destined to Die Young. 3425745 is the number. Good luck to you as you call in. Absolutely. And Sally, best of luck to you on the continued success of the book. We hope to see you right after this short break, friends.